Our spawn location is in the Minecraft community, a place where viewers watch and interact with people who play Minecraft. I remember really being into this stuff when I was younger, you know, watching Dan TDM run around in Dr. Triaris's lab, or being a part of Sky Does Minecraft's Butter Army. Now all we got is a bunch of abusers. Wilbur Suit, popular Minecraft YouTuber with 6 million subs, February 21st, 2024. Shubble, also known as Shelby, who is an ex-girlfriend of Wilbur's, started a stream titled Talking About Something More Serious. In this stream, she recounts her time while dating Wilbur, more specifically, the abuse. Shelby started to date Wilbur at some point and was promptly informed of a biting kink Wilbur had. While kink might be too much, his mom knew about it and he'd do it with others, so I don't know what to call it. But to Shelby, this came off as affectionate love bites, so she consensually agreed to having Wilbur bite her. Wilbur kept biting her, but over time began to bite her too hard and hurt her by accident. These accidents would happen way too frequently, so Shelby in response implemented a safe word. This pretty much did nothing though. Wilbur would weaponize the safe word because now he knew when she was hurt to the point of saying something and would constantly get her to that point. Shelby would constantly tell him not to bite so hard and over time would start to deny that he was even biting her that hard. Wilbur would also bite her in front of people like their friend group to joke about it. Shelby was covered in bruises on her arms and Wilbur also poked at those, showing them off and making fun of her for it. Because her arms were covered in bruises, and because some of the jokes made were basically, ha, this kinda looks like abuse, Wilbur moved from biting her arms to biting her legs. At this point, the relationship was deteriorating fast. Several things that Shelby came to expect from the relationship, like marriage and kids, Wilbur shot down the possibility of despite being so keen on it before. And the last push for Shelby was when Wilbur told her that she grew to resent her. After that, she broke up with him. The rest of the stream is just her talking about how bad of a boyfriend Wilbur is. When she came over to visit him, he sat on his computer, he lived in filth and Shelby basically played maid, stuff like that. Her stream was received really well, but as in every situation, there are two wolves. In this case, we have the believers and the non-believers. Okay, that's a bit drastic. It's not that they don't believe Shelby, they just provide a healthy level of skepticism, so we'll call them the skeptics. Also, this group is primarily made up of the commentary community as well as other drama channels like Nicholas Diorio, Chud Logic, Lyrics, etc. As for any story, you could pick apart the narrative and point out things that sound weird, which is what the skeptics did. For example, and without victim blaming, Shelby and Wilbur lived an ocean apart from one another and Shelby would fly to him from time to time. So if Shelby ever felt uncomfortable during any part of the relationship, like when Wilbur started hurting her, or when she put in a safe word, or when he abused the safe word, or when he started lying, or when he went against previous claims of marriage and kids, Shelby could have just not flown to him. People ask why we stay, it's so hard to explain to ourselves because we abandon all of our reason. Like you're in a discord relationship, girl. I wasn't safe anymore with this person, but I couldn't see that. Like. Did you hang up? Like, why did you fly to go see him? Like, you didn't realize, like, hey, I'm not really safe with this person. Better fly to, like, better fly to the UK. It's a long distance relationship essay that makes no sense to me. Picking at the story presented is sometimes useful, as you'll see in a little bit, but for now, it doesn't really matter too much. I could easily just use the allegation to disprove my earlier questioning by saying, yeah, that is stupid. But Shelby does admit to it, sound regretful, and talks about how she has gone to therapy because she realized that there was a problem. It took me 10 months after to heal, and I spoke with multiple therapists and tried different forms of therapy. And look, I love fighting over and picking apart testimonies. In fact, we're gonna do a lot of it later. But to actually get anywhere, we're gonna need some hardcore evidence, which is what the skeptics have a bigger problem with. There is no evidence. The problem really isn't that there's no evidence, it's the fact that we're about to crucify a man for a story that is not backed up by evidence. The fact that someone can come and recount a story with no type of screenshot or evidence, and before we even hear another side or perspective of the story, the accused is already being demonized like crazy, is a really scary precedent to set. The skeptics here are the minority though, and what I just said happened. Although his name was not mentioned in the entire stream, people figured out it was Wilbur and he got dogged on pretty hard. Like it was a war zone out there. Luckily, Wilbur responded a week later on Twitter. 
The first paragraph states that Wilbur believes that her feelings are valid and wants to be respectful while also sharing his perspective. Paragraph 2, he admits that he was selfish and slobbish during the end of their relationship. He is seeking therapy and is not the person he was before. In paragraph 3, Wilbur says that he's shocked by these allegations because from his perspective, the biting was completely consensual. He even has messages to prove that but will not show them out of respect. In the last paragraph, Wilbur says that he's committed to addressing Shelby's concerns going forward and ready to re-earn the trust of the people around him. God, this apology sucks. First, this whole paragraph is useless. In fact, it would be better if it wasn't here at all. Saying that Shelby's feelings are valid and then saying that he thought the whole biting thing was consensual comes off as a contradiction to many because if her feelings are valid, she feels that you abused her, which you obviously disagree with. Wilbur is not going to therapy and we all know that. He alludes to having messages that disprove what Shelby is claiming but refuses to show them which is so dumb. Shelby on March 1st came back to respond to Wilbur on Twitter. There's nothing here, you can read it if you want. She thanks people for supporting her and combats Wilbert's statement by saying, no, you're lying, and then saying what she said in her initial stream. The only weird thing is this line. You're telling me that throughout this relationship, which was somewhat online, there was no text message sent discussing the biting and how much she didn't like it. Like she only talked about it while it happened and over text she just pretended it never happened or something. Weird, but not much we can gain from it unless someone dumps some logs. After this on March 9th, Alice comes out with her own story about Wilbur. This one isn't being discussed as much and I'm actually not sure why. Alice started dating Wilbur in 2019 It was love bombed during the honeymoon phase of the relationship. After that faded, Wilbur became different. Alice was told to keep her relationship with him a secret for her safety, which I'll say right now there's nothing wrong with that. What is weird if true is that Alice would have to hide in the corner of his room until he was done streaming. Wilbur would say condescending things to Alice about her interests, ignore her self-harm marks, and pretty much only talk about and care about himself. She also experienced the biting. Alice believed that she was putting all of the effort into the relationship. So as a test, she just stopped messaging Wilbur and he never responded again, ending the relationship. In 2021, they reconnected and met up again as Alice wanted some closure. Instead, he got her drunk, took an Uber to his house, and she blacked out. The only thing she remembers before blacking out is Wilbur removing her clothes without permission. So, what's next for Wilbur? Well, not good things if he doesn't respond. Pretty much everyone is on Shelby's side. Huge creators both in the Minecraft community and not came out to support Shelby. Quackity came out and said that Wilbur is no longer a part of the QSMP. People started to dig back into his content past and try to pin him on other stuff which I think is silly. Some sort of revolt happened in his Discord server I guess. He unmodded all of his mods and removed a bot that would send links to domestic violence charities. It is looking really really bad for Wilbur right now and the only person who could stop that is Wilbur. Even some of the skeptics or people who are willing to hear Wilbur out have nothing to work with because either Wilbur is gearing up for another response or he just gave up completely. He supposedly has logs to disprove Shelby, so he needs to post it. If he doesn't care about his career going to flames, why should any of us? Puns, 320k on YouTube, February 27th, 2024. This one is a bit unique because we don't initially start out with allegations and callouts yet. Andy VMG receives a message on Tumblr asking her to speak up about abuse like everyone else. So she does, with the disclaimers that it is long, not to make this about the ex they know about, which is puns, and a trigger warning. She then speaks about two relationships she's been in that were poor. She gives these two men names of number one and number six. Number one is Puns, so we'll start from there. Puns and Andy were in the same friend group and started talking to one another, growing closer together. Then Andy told Puns that she had feelings for him. They started dating and they spoke all the time, but Andy felt like Puns was bored by her and not interested so she would constantly demand his attention. She started to become very clingy and needy as a result of this, but from her perspective, Punz was always distracted and she felt invisible. Punz only cared about her when she was talking to other guys. Andy then recounts a time when she had a close friend given the name S. She and S were very close, they hung out a ton, even more than she did with Punz. He didn't like that and starts arguing with her about him, specifically about the amount of time he'd spend with him, and eventually, Andy cuts S off and never speaks to him again. After this, nothing changed. Andy still felt like Punz was annoying her and she was still begging him to love and care about her. This all culminates in a breakup with a quoted message that you all can read. After they broke up, they decided to stay friends but still did everything a relationship involved. A little bit later, a friend of Punz hits up Andy. We'll call him B. B would chat with Andy and even flirt with her but it was nothing serious as she still loved puns. She liked the attention though, so it continued. Andy told puns about her
her conversations with B, and he threw a fit over this, calling her crazy and saying they were done. B and Andy would later speak about the situation, specifically making fun of the fact that he broke up with Andy, but got mad at someone else paying attention to her. Puns forced Andy to show him the DMs from that conversation, and he gets even more pissed off. Then he calls her, and they get back together. Now in relationship part 2, Puns treated Andy more like garbage, presumably under the guise of earning his affection again. He had cancelled on her to hang out with friends, they never went out, and only hung out and spoke to each other when he wanted to. This sent her into a depression and she started to self-harm. Puns didn't care though. When they hung out, he pointed out how sad she was. They would get into fights often and every time it would end with her locking herself in the bathroom, sobbing, and nearly throwing up while he was on the phone. One argument given as an example was when Puns asked her if he'd leave him for Harry Styles, with her answer being yes as a joke. That argument almost ended their relationship and a quote given is, you should warn people before they fall in love with you that you're so mentally ill because you're always going to bring down the mental state of who you're with. Punj would use mental health against Andy a lot by calling her clingy, needy, and too much. These arguments of why don't you love me and things of that nature would happen a lot to the point where their mutual friends would become sick of it and constantly tell her to break up with him. She finally broke up with him on their one year anniversary because instead of going out, he wanted to play video games. They stayed friends after this and Punch was still interested in her, saying that he'd get therapy, go to the gym, treat her better, and take her on dates. But she was done. She called him one last time and she then broke it off completely. March 10th. After thinking about it and seeing everyone else come out, Andy decides to put a name to the previous story, that being puns, and makes another extremely long Tumblr post adding more to the situation between them. Firstly, she was getting a ton of hate from his fan base, so he told her that the relationship should stay private. The reason she got this hate was because she said the B slur for Mexicans somewhere online. And then she points out that Puns had also used this word towards her, specifically when she was writing her apology for using the word. She would further elaborate on slightly racist comments he made, like making fun of her for her Spanish accent, or when being asked to visit her in Puerto Rico, he gave excuses like, I didn't like the heat or it's dangerous there, isn't it? Or when watching Bridgington, he implied that the Sharma sisters were too dark for him to be attracted to them. This led to an inferiority that she felt due to race. The next paragraph is about how puns constantly made Andy feel like she was embarrassed to be with her. The first example references back to the drama we just discussed of her using the B word. The second one was when she wanted to FaceTime him once and puns didn't want to because he had people in a hotel with him. The next paragraph is about him berating her. If they argued, he would call her name call her needy and clingy, made fun of her for her depressive episodes, which is bad because she has BPD and attached to him. Punch was told at the beginning of the relationship by her and her mother that she needs a lot of love and care. He agreed to stick it out, but misread how severe her mental illness was. He would make fun of her for it and say that she was pretending. Punch made fun of her calling her fat despite her having an eating disorder. He made fun of her in front of his friends and let them say really degrading stuff about her, like this comment she heard George not found say while she was showering. One once when Andy was dealing with leg problems, she asked Puns to take her to the hospital and he didn't want to but did eventually. He complained the whole time. We finally get to the last section and the most interesting part. April 25th, 2022. It was their one year anniversary and Andy made dinner reservations, but Puns was set on playing Valorant the entire time. Andy canceled the dinner, got into a very heated argument with Puns, cooled off, and then they planned to meet up with each other at her place. Once they met up, they would get drunk and Andy would pass out. She wakes up the next morning completely naked, asks where her clothes are, and gets told by Puns that she really wanted to have sex with him and didn't want them back on when they were done. He also made fun of her for being a lightweight. Andy questioned him about the night a bit more, then broke up with him soon after. From reading these allegations, two sets of opinions spawned. The believe all women crowd believed all women. Now that sounds a bit reductive and I will say it more times in the video, but that's literally their position and they do the same thing every time. An allegation would drop in this Minecraft community, it would get unwavering support, then the hunt would begin to try to figure out who the person is. Once they find out, they absolutely destroy this person, calling them an abuser, not worth redemption, should be cancelled. In some cases, they get doxxed, and this all happens before the accused person can give their side of the story. And then there are the skeptics, who in this situation weren't moved by these claims. Sure, this relationship was absolutely awful from both ends, but does it really warrant him losing his career over it? Fucking hell, man. Dude, I fucking hate it. I hate it. I feel so bad for these guys who they've got an answer for these relationships that they've got with these crazy women who have probably put them through hell and back in their relationship. And then this is another part of that happening. 
And then they've got a fucking answer to that. In a community of people that are total fucking vultures and want to tear them apart. Oh god, it's so painful, man. Going by Andy's story, all that really happened was that due to them talking a lot and maybe outside pressure from their friend group, Punj and Andy got into a relationship that they both weren't ready for. Andy got attached too quickly and Punj underestimated how bad her mental illness was. Therefore, he failed to accommodate her needs properly. This created a toxic environment for the both of them to the point where they both realized that they weren't cut out for each other, they kept trying to force it and continued the toxic relationship. It sucks a lot, but the skeptics don't think that he should lose his career over it. For the believers though, they're pretty young and they aren't like us veterans who eat abuse allegations for breakfast. This complicated and nuanced situation comes off as black and white because to some people, in their minds, a Minecraft YouTuber should be this sexless, Disney Channel actor type person who is a stand-up guy in every aspect of their life, even the ones that don't really matter to their stream. Luckily for us, we don't have to sit here and speculate too long because puns quickly responds. March 10th. Punj responds on Twitter. He starts off by saying that they both sucked in that relationship, and the person that he was then isn't the person he is now. He makes it a point to acknowledge that it was toxic on both sides, which I think is really good to constantly point out. First, he addresses the most serious claim, that being the dubious consent on April 25th. Punj admits that it's pretty much he said, she said at this point, but he still will stand by the fact that he wouldn't take advantage of someone. He also confirms the zero intimacy thing true, stating that he has a lack of libido, so he wasn't the one initiating sex. It was Andy. Now delving into the night once more, Punz claims that he didn't realize how drunk she was, and when sex was initiated by her, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. With the whole waking up naked thing, that all happened too, but Punz never felt like Andy was accusing him at the time, and he wasn't making light of the situation. Hiding the relationship, Pun says that he did ask to keep it private, which is an obviously fine request because fans are very crazy. Racism. When it comes to the B word drama, Pun admits that he said it once, not twice like Andy said, and that he was incredibly sorry for it when he realized that he upset Andy. The My Little B part straight up didn't happen. Pun admits that he didn't want to visit Andy in Puerto Rico, not because he's racist, but because he wanted to focus on his career. While watching Bridgington, Andy asked if Pun found the actresses attractive. He said no and order to reassure his girlfriend that he was attracted to her and not her girlfriend, not because that they were too dark. Now we get the friend A from the first story. Punch says that Andy was texting this person before, during, and after the relationship, going against the narrative that Andy presented. This person was a larger creator at the time and closely associated with Punch, so her talking to him was a huge breach of trust. Pun says that friend A was actually the one who told him that Andy was talking to him privately, not Andy. And when confronted, Andy claims that she didn't remember what she sent and that she deleted the messages. Andy and friend A, as stated in Andy's original post, were both flirting with one another and making fun of puns. She did show these messages, but not all of them, and things were hidden from him. She eventually did show what she was hiding. As for when they got back together after this, Punz admits that yeah, he was a bad boyfriend, but looking at it from his perspective, it was the big betrayal that made him question everything. Punz also makes it a point to say that Andy would kind of weaponize this relationship she had with friend A, because he knew that it upset him. Constantly bringing him up out of nowhere gave Punz the impression that she was purposely trying trying to hurt him, which is why he broke it off with her. And even after the relationship, Andy was still pursuing friend A despite being warned by others. Next, we get new information as puns tell us about friend B. Friend B was another person who had a larger platform than puns, and they were good friends. Before their relationship, Andy and friend B would message each other flirtatiously, and Andy would even send him nudes. Something that Andy denied when asked about it, but friend B said happened. Sometime in 2021, when this whole friend group was hanging out together, Andy was all over friend B, to the point that others in this group took notice. Puns asked about this, Andy denied it, and made him think that he was crazy. Just another example of him slowly losing trust in her. Punch admits that he did make some pretty invalidating comments about Andy's mental health and had no prior experience with someone who had BPD. He loved her and said that he could handle it, but misunderstood how bad it really was. Due to this, lots of issues arose that they couldn't fix, which led to a bad time for the both of them. Two last sections finally. Regarding the comment George made on the call, Punch's retelling is that Andy was actually trying to get Punch to do sexual stuff in the shower. George overheard this and made the comment that he should just go have sex with her, and Punch called him out for it. Andy didn't even hear this interaction go down and had to be told that it happened after. Punz denies ever calling Andy fat and making fun of her ED and ends the statement by saying that it was a toxic relationship on both sides and showing us the last time Andy messaged him, apologizing for what she did. 
Yeah, no, so none of this should have been made public. This was obviously a very toxic relationship. Who committed the most harm to the other party is pretty much impossible to tell because it's just testimony, nor does it really matter. And even accounting for both testimonies in my psychoanalysis, nothing cancel worthy really happened. Pun should probably keep his career because it is insane to cancel someone over them being toxic in a pretty shitty relationship. Plus he did sound well meaning and he did own up to a lot of his mistakes. And he also shouldn't lose whatever she has, I don't know how public of a figure she is. But I do think she should get a bit of criticism for trying to come out and cancel this guy over a toxic relationship. A relationship they were both toxic in. And I'm glad to say that most people agree with me. Now, people are very accepting of Puns' apology. They're glad he took accountability. People are pointing out that yes, it's long, but if you refuse to read it, then you never really cared if abuse actually happened. You just wanted to go on a witch hunt, which I agree with. And he would publish a response a day later, saying that they both just remember things differently. That he is still friends with friends A and B, which might show some hypocrisy. That the final message that Puns provided as evidence she made when she was distressed, which Puns could have not possibly known because they weren't talking, and that she wasn't accepting his apology. People reacted to this by saying that Andy's new response was a bit weak, something seemed off about it, and that it was kind of unfair to him. Puns had the patience to own up to what he did and respectfully address Andy's allegations, but Andy can't do the same towards Puns. It looks like one man gets to keep his career. So Puns releases a new statement. I have no idea what possessed him to make this Twitter post. It was made on March 12th and it was deleted that same day. In the post, Puns reveals that friend A, the person who hit up Andy, started flirting with her and whom Puns got angry at was Dream. He and Dream were not close friends despite what others think. In fact, he kind of feared Dream because Dream gave him everything and with a drop of a hat, he could take it all away. And if some drama were to spawn, everyone would take Dream's side and not his. He goes on to elaborate on Dream's relationship with Andy, saying that he tried to confront Dream about him flirting with Andy, but he deflected every time. Dream actually found it amusing that it got under his skin so badly. Basically, to sum up this post, while Puns and Andy were in this toxic relationship where they constantly broke up and got back together, Dream was a guy that Andy would flirt with, and he knew that it upset Puns, so he started to taunt him. Again, none of this should have been made public and he quickly realized that because it was deleted. I don't really have much else to comment on. I don't think that this statement detracts from the other statements. There are tweets that do, but we'll get to that later. Quackity, 6 million subs, not accused of sexual abuse or abuse in regards to a relationship, but was in drama while everyone else was, so I'm including it here. March 4th, 2024, Quackity fires up a stream that's like 3 minutes long, where he discusses some workplace drama when it comes to his QSMP. Context for the uninitiated. SMP stands for Survivor Multiplayer, and it's basically a huge server where a ton of people, mainly Minecraft content creators, all share a world and survive in it. Apparently, Quackity's SMP was one of of, if not the biggest Minecraft server around, at least big enough to warrant needing both employees and volunteers. A lot of these employees and volunteers were also French. There was a huge thread a day before Quackity's response where someone who worked on the team spoke about art they weren't getting paid for, how all the volunteers are burnt out, and they can't speak about it because they are threatened with being sued if they say anything. This Leah person in particular seems to have her own personal gripes as well since she was fired for some reason. It's hard to grasp what happened because this whole thread was translated from French to English and I'm coming from this like an outsider. But after she was fired, she was given a low payment. Here's a more recent statement that might shed some more light and for context, in this Minecraft server, they have this egg pet thing named Palm, who was played by an admin in the server. That admin was fired, so the community made a huge collab piece in honor of the admin's character. This bit is from a statement that was attached. A few weeks ago, a former role-playing admin of QSMP exposed the working conditions of the entire admin team. This was followed by testimonies from several other admins who also shared their experiences. We later learned that the admin playing Poem was also removed from the project and left without any news since. Absolutely no one has contacted her. The French content creators have spoken out on the subject and have pressured the QSMP management team to be able to improve the admin's working conditions and to bring Poem back to the server who has experienced injustice. We want to pay tribute to Palm to show her our support in this situation as well as thanking her for her excellent work during all these months on the QSMP. Anyway, Quackity responds rather quickly and here's what he has to say. What I'm gathering is that volunteers for Quackity Studios are not being paid and are being given too many hours of activities. I want to let everyone know that I was aware of a voluntary position 
And I was under the assumption that there was a process volunteers would go through to integrate themselves to the team uh, with a fully paying job. Uh, what I was not aware of is to what extent and conditions uh, were being required from the volunteers. I'm going to perform a deep investigation personally on this matter as to see exactly what's happening. But one thing is very clear to me. There are going to be very drastic changes in QSMP moving forward from the administrative perspective and from the creative perspective as well. Everybody involved in Quackity Studios will be paid. And if at any point my own funds are not sufficient enough to pay workers or maintain the project, then the QSMP cannot continue and it will close down. A few days later, this was posted. And yes, it seems like Quackity is being investigated by a French labor union for unfair workplace treatment. It's not funny, but it's also a little bit funny. This statement from them says that after making a call for testimonies regarding the workplace environment of the Quackity SMP, they saw a lot of huge issues like illegal conditions, not being paid enough and getting burnt out, distressing working conditions, no communication with others and constantly being dumped tons of work in emergencies, toxic management, threats and lack of upper communication, and an almost non-existent legal framework like no contracts are being presented with a crazy NDA. They go on to say that there was a blurred line between employee and volunteer, which QSMP took advantage of. Once this drama kicked off, the server had a lockdown to fully investigate the allegations. During this time, the higher ups decided that they were sidelining the volunteers and discontinuing their work, which in French law constitutes as unlawful dismissals. Some of these workers have been left in the dark about what's going on for more than 10 days, which can be considered moral harassment. Quackity claims that he solved the problem by firing the manager who made the first statement and that he doesn't approve of it, but those same inexcusable work conditions are still in place. Finally, there are sufficient grounds for legal action, but Quackity can get himself unscrewed by opening a dialogue, begin negotiations regarding pay for the people who already did work but didn't get paid properly, future pay so this doesn't happen again, and improved working conditions. So a few things, one we have an update on the situation, the union or whatever is going on, they said that no contact has been attempted by Quackity, but he did fire the French admins. Another thing is that this same account retweeted a Google Doc made by the Palm admin who got fired. My French is terrible, but I believe this says I am the Palm admin. This is my history and experience for the QSMP. I have no idea what this part means. Anyway, I'm not going through the document, but it's just the Palm admin's evidence and his his story, his side of things. The last thing and what I really wanted to read is this Twitter post because you know for every section I try to give both sides, you know, the believers and the skeptics and I saw that this person was giving a little bit of pushback to the French Union so I wanted to read it out. So let me get this straight, the French Union that was calling out the QSMP for lack of communication has made no attempt to even email Quackity to open communication knowing full well he isn't on Twitter and is saying it's on him to contact them. This feels unprecedented professional. How did they plan to sue the QSMP? All Quackity would have to do is say they made no legitimate attempts to reach out to him via accepted business methods and the case would be dead on arrival because Quackity was never given a reasonable chance to resolve things. This is baffling at this point. Not to defend either side, Quackity definitely does have a responsibility to track this stuff and I see why the union want him to reach out, but this issue just keeps being miscommunication after miscommunication and it's getting ridiculous. Okay that was a lot and I'm not gonna pretend that I understood any of it. The TLDR is that the union investigated some of the working conditions, saw that there was some weird stuff, and now is decided to keep a close eye on them. If Quackity does everything right and compensates well, then he doesn't get sued. Otherwise, that's pretty much it for this drama. Draggy by the way, 4k subs on YouTube, 35k on Twitch, super small guy compared to the heavyweights on this list, but he is a Minecraft YouTuber, has connections with some of these people, and was caught up in this campaign to expose them all. Muzi comes out with a thankfully short statement on March 9th. She states that Draggy was creepy towards her and other women, made sexual comments about Moonzi only weeks after knowing one another, and that his behavior had grooming tendencies. She does not elaborate on what these tendencies are. She was 18 at the time and didn't trust him nor wanted to be around him, so she went to other content 
content creators to confide in them and even look for help. They instead told her story like gossip. She was also told that she was being dramatic and blowing it all out of proportion. Later, a girl anonymously came out against Draggy and all of these content creators thought it was Moonzy, telling her to be an adult and get into a call with Draggy to work it out. She goes on to talk about all of these content creators who swept for Draggy and how disappointed she was seeing this. It apparently took other girls coming forward in order for these content creators to drop him. Now, it's four years later, she sees everyone else coming out with their stories and she's happy for them. This was the worst one we've read. Let me explain why. As many pointed out, to the point where the tweet had a community note placed on it, Draggy and Moonzy are the same age. Actually, Moonzy was apparently older than him. So it's hard to believe that Draggy groomed this person or had grooming tendencies, whatever that means. She never elaborates. Forgetting all of that, this statement has nothing to do with Draggy. Draggy is the only name attached, but what he actually did isn't delved into, and according to Moonzy, it looks like he was properly exposed and shunned for his actions. This is a post calling out the Minecraft content creators who swept for Draggy and didn't take Moonzy seriously, since that's the thing she talks about the most. Now this would hold some kind of merit if let's say Katie was the one who was carrying water for Draggy. Or how about Ainsley, who has been in the replies of most of these dramas calling these people abusers before they even had a chance to give their side. That would be huge, but Moonsley doesn't give out any of these names so it doesn't mean anything. Everyone saw it and didn't think twice. Draggy responded and I'm so tired of reading. This sums it up well. I did not groom Moonsy. Moonsy is in fact older than me. I saw Moonsy on Lover Host. I was attracted to her so I shot my shots in DMs live to which she responded and initiated a conversation. Flirting was reciprocated. Moonsy initiated asking me to play games. Moonzy sent me her discord without asking. Moonzy tweeted at me, now deleted you can see in the DMs, about going on a Minecraft date. I never made any sexual comments towards Moonzy. Draggy also dumped his entire DMs with Moonzy. The conversation they had was reciprocated and fine, at least it kinda seemed like that, I skimmed through it. But the end is noteworthy. Moonzy made a flirty comment towards Carl Jacobs. Draggy was hurt by this and responded in a kinda jokey way. Moonzy made it clear that it was a joke, thought that this flirty relationship she had with Draggy was a joke, and made it clear that she was not looking for a relationship. Draggy profusely apologizes and Moonzy is fine to drop it. Then Draggy gets kicked out of the SMP for making Moonzy uncomfortable. He also addresses the other women who had a problem with him, saying that he debunked that a while ago in another video. Then the final messages are of him trying to apologize and figure out why he was kicked from the SMP. And finally, there is a request to leave Draggy alone because he isn't even in the community anymore and this happened 4 years ago. The dude who left the Minecraft community cleared better than the people trying to keep their careers. This one was pretty clear cut draggy is fine and moonzy got criticized for this dude she's th like th and the girl's ruthless too like this is four years ahead of time right yes like so she she wrote in the thing and i don't know if she meant like uh other content creators have sexualized her between 18 and 22 but i have not spoke to her since 2020 october 2020 yeah and this whole like do you even can you do you even understand where she's even getting from this whole making weird sexual comments and grooming tendencies? No, do you have any so clue? I, I will be 100% honest, right? At the start, I was genuinely second guessing myself. I was like, what if I did say something that made her uncomfortable? But then uh, I, it would have had to be through Discord, right? But I like deleted my Discord long ago and well, I didn't delete it. I just changed, spammed a bunch of characters and changed the name and. I couldn't get back into it and then i got back into it and i looked and we literally had two discord messages dude i mean like and you know these people in this fan base too in this community they are out yeah i was blood. a part of i was a part of it for a long time and that's like part of the reason why i quit so after the first allegations happened where i was falsely accused of pedophile and stuff like i got a lot of viewers from it but i was always so like anxious on stream and just always like thinking about what I'm saying and what I'm doing and uh, it just like it just like tormented me so that's why I quit where she says uh creators dropped me it wasn't that at all I literally just ghosted the entire scene okay the last one and the biggest one to put this into perspective all of these victims of abuse came out to call out their abusers because they were initially inspired by Shelby's call out of Wilbur. After this allegation dropped, it absolutely dwarfed the others to the point that no one even cares about the Wilbur stuff anymore. It's only about this. 
George Not Found, 10 million subs on YouTube, popular Minecraft creator. On March 9th, 2024, Katie Bugs goes live on her Twitch channel and reads off a statement that she prepared beforehand. Katie claims that she was drunk in a hotel room when she was 18 with a man 8 years older than her and more powerful. That man was George, but she does not say his name. The story goes like this. She was at her first ever convention and she was nervous, so she stuck by her friend. They were at a party when they decided to leave. It was her, her best friend, and three others. One of these friends was romantically talking to a big content creator, who will call friend D, and wanted to go back to the hotel room that he was staying at. So Katie and some of the friend group followed. Once there in the hotel room, the makeup of the room was Katie, her two friends, and two guys. One of them being George, and the other one being friend D. Apparently George was flirting with Katie the entire night, but because he was older, they assumed he didn't know the age. Later that night when she left, George messaged her on Instagram, and in her bio it showed her age, so he must have knew. Skip to the next night, Katie found herself in the same situation. They were at a party, her one friend who was romantically talking to the big content creator guy, friend D, wanted to go back to his hotel room, but didn't want to go alone so she tagged along. There was a friend who spotted her in the hallway headed to the room and expressed concern because they felt something was wrong. Now we end up in the same situation as night one, Katie and her two friends with two other larger content creators, George and friend D. All three of these girls were crazy drunk and stumbling and the men encouraged them to drink some more and insisted on playing drinking games. They all sat on a couch and George sat next to Katie. It was around 3 a.m. During this drinking game, Katie was asked the question about her age and she answered saying that she was 18 and a virgin at the time. A little after this, Katie started playing games on her phone and George slipped his hand under her clothes on the couch in front of everyone asking her if she was ticklish. She said no while staring at her phone. People including her friend were watching them and George began to inch his hands closer to unwanted places. He also began to make it a game by touching her in places to get her to lose the phone game she was playing. This terrified Katie paralyzing her in that spot for minutes until she got up. Later that night, she found herself alone with George and friend D. 6 a.m. rolls around and the night ends. Katie and George walk to the elevator together. Katie didn't get on. George makes a joke saying that the elevator wasn't working and for her to check it out, but she didn't. And after, the night finally ended. Afterwards, George messaged Katie on Instagram and flirted with her until it died off slowly. You can read the rest for yourself, but it goes on with Katie talking about how that event really changed her life for the worse. Now that the story is told, we again have two sides, the believers and the skeptics. But we're not going to talk about the skeptics right now. They'll come later. Once this statement was made, the believers were at maximum force. One thing I will heavily criticize Katie for is not putting a name to the allegation because remember, George was never mentioned in that stream. Like there's really no point in hiding the name because this crazy community is going to figure it out anyway and they might even accidentally accuse someone else falsely. In fact, Katie had to put out a tweet saying that it wasn't Wilbur. Dude, just tell us. But yeah, the first job for the believers was to figure out who actually committed the crime. The Minecraft stands were on it, and using recently made tweets, we found out that the creator who did the assault was George. The other male friend and hotel room owner was Dream, and the convention was Anaheim VidCon 2023. March 10th, George tweets out absolutely confirming it was him, and says that he will respond in a stream that day. The stream wouldn't happen as he decided to delay it. Katie makes a new statement that's a lot bolder than the previous one. She says that she has screen recordings of everything and even gave George permission to leak everything, but is confident that he won't because everyone knows what he did and who he is. She called him a child and a fucking coward. I wonder where the new confidence came from because it wasn't there before, especially since Katie didn't even mention George's name in the original allegation. Anyway, Believer Force was at an all time high. Fans were turning against George and Dream by the second, like they were docs at some point which is never good. It was very dire, but it would all change for the better later that day. George streams, but it's actually a pre-made video that he's streaming which I absolutely approve of. Getting into the stream, we run through the events again. The first time Katie and George met was in Dream's hotel room. Dream was in a group chat with Katie and all her friends. Katie and her friends were at a VidCon after party and wanted Dream to come hang out but he didn't want to go because he was still wearing the mask and didn't want to deal with it. We get messages of the girls and Dream discussing how to meet up 
and that they wanted to come to Dream's hotel room. Thing is, you need a VidCon creator badge to come in, so only Katie and two of her friends came to the hotel. That first night was normal, but George comments on the age and how he thought they were all at least 21 because of the tight security from the previous event they came from. And looking back at the messages, he saw this image showing one of them having an over 21 wristband. With the Instagram bio, he just didn't see it. Now moving to the next and last day of VidCon. George had an online friend that happened to be in the area, so he came down to visit. Dream was bored in his hotel room, so asked George and his friend to come over. And then the same scenario plays out from last night, where Katie and her friends also decide to come over to Dream's hotel room. The difference between this night and last night, however, their entire friend group was able to go, making 8 people in total. George, George's online friend, friend D, Katie, and 4 other girls. George then points out how certain things are phrased in Katie's response for it to seem worse than it is. For instance, Katie says that it was one friend tried to go to Dream's hotel room but didn't want to go alone so they all followed her. But instead, it was all of them who really wanted to come and it's shown that they were theorizing in the group chat. Also, it was strange that Katie didn't mention George's online friend who was there nor did she mention the three other friends. Anyway, the night begins and it's the same as before, everyone chatting and drinking. Katie says that George and the boys were pressuring her to drink, which George refutes, saying that actually they were all drunk at the time and that they were the ones who insisted on playing drinking games. They moved to the couch where George sat next to Katie, no one complained about him being creepy, and Katie gave no indication of that to George, so he couldn't have possibly known. As for the phone thing and Katie trying to avoid the situation by using her phone, George didn't see that as the case because they were all using the phone to play the mobile game and had a good time, passing it around and trying to get a high score. In fact, after VidCon, they would both continue to message one another new high scores they got. So everyone there was on the couch, playing this game on her phone, and on the far end of the couch is George and Katie, who were cuddling. They have been cuddling for at least an hour with his hand placed around her waist. The environment was fun and light, and Katie showed no signs of discomfort or unease. As for Katie being asked about her age, and her saying that she was 18 and a virgin, George just doesn't remember this happening. He also reiterates that it wasn't the case that George and these guys were getting these girls drunker and drunker, they were all drinking and the girls wanted to play the games. Now comes the big claim, putting his hand under her shirt and disguising it as tickling. George admits that yes, he did place his hand on her waist and under her shirt, but they have been cuddling for an hour before that. It was also not sudden and it happened very slowly, making sure that she was comfortable. He admits that yes, he did poke and tickle her to make her lose the game, but she was laughing the entire time and showed no signs of feeling discomfort. She was smiling and play fighting George. George also mentions in response to Katie saying that she was basically paralyzed in fear in that one spot that she actually got up many times during the night and came back to that scenario. Katie also chose to stay many hours after her friends left. Dream decided that the night was over because he wanted to sleep, so they both left at the same time. Not how Katie implied like George was following her. As for the elevator, Katie had her hotel room on the same floor as Dream, so it was actually her walking George to the elevator. Once there, George did try to make a bad elevator is broken joke, saw that she wasn't going for it, and just left. After VidCon, George and Katie would continue to chat it up casually, and there was even a point where they were both in London, and Katie was alluding to maybe meeting up, but nothing happened. George then ends the live stream by saying that he understands how Katie feels, but it's pretty unfair to paint him as the bad guy. This was an absolutely fantastic response. Dream would also post a statement on Reddit that same day, basically saying that George's recollection of that night was more accurate than Katie's. Lastly, on the same night, Katie would post her response to George's stream on Twitter. This is where the sleeper skeptics come in, because now they have both a narrative and evidence that they could pick apart. The believers had absolutely dominated the space. So now let's look at Katie's statement with a healthy, respectful, non-victim blamey dose of skepticism. Katie says that George didn't get consent from her and that she was drunk, which ends the conversation for her there. It shouldn't and that's obviously stupid. Verbal consent is always great, but we all know that's not what happens in the real world. Katie showed no signs of discomfort and even went along with it, playing with George. When George said that silence is not consent, that's what he's referring to. Your body language and mood can be an indicator of what you want. This idea alone completely shattered the average Minecraft viewer's brain, 
but we're just getting started. Katie talks about the group messages and says that George wasn't in the group chat, which A, he admitted that, and B, it doesn't mean anything to bring this up. The messages he showed didn't involve Katie at all, and it was her friends. The reason it's relevant is because it shows that at least your friends were suggesting the drinking games and were already drunk, going against the narrative that George and Dream got you guys drunk on purpose. This whole next page is nothing new despite the screenshots being shown. She's just like, yeah, we did some banner in the Insta DMs. Katie says that she didn't walk him to the elevator, they were just going in the same direction, which again, she's missing the point. You implied that what he was doing was creepily following you and he wasn't. We then get a very important piece of evidence. That online friend that George invited, Katie never mentioned because he wasn't there long, but she shows us a message he sent to one of her friends saying, I'm currently watching George 28 Cut away Katie 18. Remember this, it will be funny later. Now for the cuddling. Katie says that they were all close together on the couch and does admit that she was cuddling George, but she didn't think cuddling was a sexual thing or an invitation to do something sexual. The cuddling may have been professional, but she was drunk. She wasn't going to push him off in front of everyone and she questioned why George would do this sexual act in front of everyone. She could have moved. She just says that there were a lot of social dynamics at play, like George's ego that she didn't want to hurt in front of people, or the fact that you usually sit back down in the same spot you get back up in. As for her staying while her friends left, she didn't make the conscious decision to stay. Everyone was super drunk to the point where one friend was throwing up and passed out, and she stayed because she thought this was the price to pay as a content creator. I don't understand why we can blame George for any of this. He just wanted to have a good time and probably wasn't thinking that this was a social networking event to get his clout up. Body language memes. This whole paragraph talks about how George and her just met, which has nothing to do with body language at all. None of these things mentioned next are invitations. What is, is being playful, having fun, not feeling distressed, not telling him that you're uncomfortable. Also, invitation is being framed like, oh, you get the signal and you go right ahead full force. George just shot his shot and he did it very slowly. And if she didn't like it, she could have communicated it via body language. Or since we love verbal consent and we're demanding it from George, how about we say, hey, I don't want you to touch me there. Skipping ahead because it's a bit too long, Katie reboots the he was too drunk argument with this and it makes no sense. Yeah, he was drunk but still aware of what he was doing. He recounts the night fine and was deliberately taking it slow and making sure she was comfortable with it. If he would have shown signs of discomfort or told him not to do that, he probably would have stopped. And if he doesn't, then that's when you raise hell. Then we get these messages that disprove that everyone in the room could verify that Katie was comfortable. Looks shocking at first if you read it, but again, George couldn't have known that any of this was going on. You said you were chilling in the moment. The bigger issue I want to bring up here is your friends, because these are some shitty friends. They're going around with someone under the drinking age, getting her wasted beyond belief according to her, and now we see that a friend saw that she was somewhat uncomfortable during the party and said nothing. How would George know when literally no one around him is giving him any signs? Next, the wristband. She says again she omitted the other friends because they left early and says that the wristband image isn't her arm, it's her friends. Katie says that the wristband talk was initiated because they were trying to get into an 18 plus party that you needed a wristband to enter. They had asked people for the 18 plus wristband to enter the party, not the 21 plus wristband to drink. They were just trying to get into the party and didn't stay long because not everyone in their group got one. We have this section where it's shown that Clay, I think Clay is another friend in the group, knew about the age. She speaks on the question about her age and virginity and then goes on to talk about other things in the last page that isn't too important. The entire community was split on this. Despite me looking at her statement in the lens of a skeptic, people still supported Katie unequivocally. Some thought her response was really good while others thought it was bad. Slowly over time, people realize that some things just don't match up. For example, it's really really weird that Katie omitted the fact that her and George were cuddling for at least an hour. That's like really important information. Katie used the now infamous words freshly 18 when she wasn't freshly 18. She had been 18 for about 5 months at that point. Apparently that wasn't Katie's first convention, she had been to TwitchCon before. This doesn't happen until days later, but it's better to put it here now. Ghosty, one of Katie's best friends that was there that night, completely contradicts Katie's story by saying that they arrived to Dreams Hotel sober on the second day. They couldn't have drank at the Instagram party because some of them couldn't get in and Katie wasn't 21. She says that Katie must have misspoke 
but she's reading a prepared typed statement. Then Ghosty completely backtracks on this statement, saying that they did drink before going, just not at the Instagram party. This blunder would make Katie look even worse. And with the newly added member to the Skeptic Squad, Destiny, the real question started to be asked. If what Katie said was true, was it all that bad? Like, why are we leaking this? Like, you are lucky. <laughs> You're lucky that that was the only thing that happened. This is like, this is such a lucky lesson learned. Like, okay, I was underage, drinking. I was already pretty dumb. Probably shouldn't go back to the hotel room with guys alone. Some guy kind of like felt me up a little bit, but nothing happened and then I left. That is a lucky scenario. That's lucky. Nothing happened. You're good. Like, holy shit. What an easy way to learn a lesson without anything fucking insane happening. Wait, what the fuck? Even in the original story, no sexual assault occurred. They were cuddling. George made a very slow move with his hand up her waist and under her shirt, and that's it. Are we really canceling this guy for that? Like, we pick this shit apart. He posts like a good response. We defend him, and then now. Well, there's we not even anything to pick apart. Like, even the original accusation is just like kind of weak. It's weak. <laughs> it has no proof, and yeah. his his response, in my opinion, like pretty much bodies. Well, it. no, like even okay. if I just want to be ultra clear. Even if what she said originally had happened verbatim, I don't think anything wrong has even happened at that point. Except for maybe underage drinking. Like, even if everything she said, even if there was no cuddling and he was like well, kind of testing. I think what she said initially was like she was just sitting and then all of a sudden he put his hand up her shirt. Like that's what she said. Oh, was it? Oh, because I thought she said it happened over an, an hour. She said that they were they were like talking over the course of an hour or whatever. And then at some point he just like, like she's just sitting there next to him. And he's like, are you ticklish? And puts his hand up her shirt right away. Oh, okay. I don't know. Like, it just, like that happens. Yeah, like, this... like that's obviously not. That's not. If, if you if you've never touched anyone before, you've never touched someone. You're not flirting at all, which is the way that she's made it seem like it. You know, it was going down. And then someone puts it, puts their hand up your shirt. That is weird. Yeah, she that would be weird. I guess. Like just wasn't how she I... was being forced to drink or being encouraged to drink as an 18 year old. Oh yeah, but I never. Yeah. I just always assume that's a lie. <laughs> I hear it. So there are, there are clearly messages of them being like, let's play the drinking game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. It was also that the guys brought up the drinking game which was a lie. The skeptics became the philosophers, asking the true questions when it came to the sexual assault, speaking truths unheard of to the Minecraft community. The tides were definitely turning, and George may still have a career. George made a Twitter post on March 12th, 2024. He apologized to Katie for what he did. So did George actually do something wrong? I mean, he must have if he admitted to it. Thoughts like these spread throughout the space, but it wasn't even the weirdest thing that happened that day. No, that award goes to Dream, who held a 40 minute Twitter space that I'll play some of right now. I do not think that George is a bad person. I do not think that George was sitting there thinking, oh, you know, let me, oh, I, she's not gonna like this, or oh, you know, anything. I think that uh, he did something fucked up. I think that what happened was fucked up. I think that it was terrible. And I think that I feel terrible for any involvement that I had. And I feel terrible for Katie. It is a terrible situation. It is a terrible thing, the pain that she feels. And there's nothing that I can do to change that. There's nothing that George can do to change that. A lot of people that think that I'm so calculated and everything that I do is so planned out and that, uh, you know, I'm just, I think right now that I'm being manipulative and I'm trying to, you know, I care about just my image or, but I care. I'm sorry. I care about people. And I want people to talk to me. If they have anything, any problem with anyone, including myself. So everyone had the same question on their minds. What happened? There was either something in Katie's newest response that was super damning, or something happened behind the scenes. But whatever this was made George completely 180 and apologized to someone calling him an abuser, and made Dream get on a Twitter space and cry. Lucky for you, we'd get that answer pretty soon. Well, not in internet time. It took about four days. March 16th, 2024, a new response dropped from George. First, George says that the tweet he put out was not him backtracking, even though it totally seems like he was backtracking. His perspective was changed. Now he's got to look at Katie's latest response and respond to that. The first point he brings up I already mentioned, so I'll let him say it again. 
So first, she acknowledges that the texts that I showed about them talking about wanting to play the drinking games are real, but that they were from her friends. So this is reasonable. I only brought up that point because the implication was that it was kind of creepy of us and we were forcing the game on them. He touches on Katie saying that she only went back to meet a creative that had left and shows messages we have seen before, but it does show that Katie was looking forward to George being in Dream's hotel room. George talks about how he feels kind of bad because of how Katie perceived him. He mentions this a lot, so I'll let him speak for himself and group them all together here. Because, and this is a quote, she felt lucky to be talking to a verified account, someone famous, someone I had followed and watched for a while. Now, this is not something that I was thinking about at all. I wasn't aware that she ever watched my content in the past. That was never brought up. This actually makes me feel pretty bad. The only reason she was messaging me was because I have subscribers or something. I would never want that. Again, the only reason what I wanted because why wouldn't I want that from someone like him? This is absolutely not how I think about this kind of situation at all. I would never think like that. And honestly, it's kind of an evil way to think about things. Just having the opinion that you can do anything because you're famous or whatever. And I never once remotely thought anything similar to that. And I feel terrible reading those words knowing that you think that about me. I would never think that I'm owed anything from anyone just because I have a YouTube channel. I was walking around with these people at other events or interact with them in any way and all the time they were just thinking terribly about me and I didn't even know and neither did any of my friends. If I'd seen Katie in person I would have gone up to her normally. I would have assumed we were still friends. I think this is a massive injustice to Katie. It actually kind of makes me rethink a lot of my experiences with other creators. Just looking back on it with this new information. And I don't even know who these people are. And even right now, after all of this information is public and, and out there, I still haven't had a single private conversation with anyone who knew about it prior to Katie's stream. This is all just to say that I didn't have any idea that there was a problem and I wish that I had and I should have. Then we get the big guns, the message of George's online friend who was there saying that he saw Katie and George cuddle and knew their age. This message is very important to disprove because it shows that George's friend not only knew the ages, but showed that he was bothered and uncomfortable by it. This message was also the thing that shook George and Dream so badly. Yeah, he never sent that message. Firstly, he says that this friend was the last to leave. Then he has a clip of him calling his friend saying, yeah, I didn't send the message. Then this friend recounts the night in his own eyes, which we don't have to go over, but it's important to note that George now has two witnesses, Dream and George's online friend, and all of their stories are the same. Katie only has Ghosty, and she contradicted her story. Huh, it's almost like this friend group fed Katie to a pack of wild bears and left her alone to fight this battle. As for why Katie got that message wrong, well, it was just an accident. So obviously after this conversation with him, I was pretty confused. Maybe it was like a misunderstanding or something because obviously they wouldn't just show this screenshot if it was fake because I could disprove that pretty easily. So I had Dream reach out to get some clarification on it. So they replied back and essentially just said that it was an accident and that Katie had gotten confused on who said what. George touches on the cuddling and says that she initiated some of it and it was mutual and he only brought it up because Katie omitted it from her original allegation. There was a lot of pushing against the narrative. Katie says that she didn't know her friend left. George says that she wished her goodbye and stayed after. George says that he didn't know that someone felt uncomfortable, which is something that gets glossed over a lot and why you're going to hear me say it a lot. How is he supposed to know that people were feeling uncomfortable when no one before, during, or after expressed those feelings to him and during the event, everyone gave signs that they were okay and having a good time? In fact, to further prove his point, George shows DMs between Ghosty and Dream. Someone had tweeted about Dream inviting 18 year olds back into his hotel room to drink. Freaking out, he sends this to Ghosty and she agrees that it was insane. So now we have Dream, George, George's friend, and Ghosty all corroborating one story and going against Katie. George shows a clip of Ghosty talking about the messages, but it's stupid. Even if you were talking about Dream, you're also talking about the night and how fine everything was. George touches on the wristband, showing us that sure, Katie Katie in that photo wasn't the one wearing it, but they had a strap where they would slip off the wristbands to sneak in places. I hate Katie's friends so much and we've only heard from one out of four of them. George talks about the age one more time, saying that it was weird that he didn't know her age. Firstly, her age was in her name, not her bio, and secondly, her Instagram account was a business account. 
So the smiley face in 19 never showed up when George was texting her. Alright, new section. March 24th. Katie responds to like everything. George's second response, kinda. The criticism she's gotten. The entire space as a whole. Once finished, it had mixed reception. You know, believers and skeptics. I even tweeted out some interesting stuff that I'll bring up later. But since this is freshly new, I want to make this its own section and politely disagree while not victim blaming and being respectful. What you'll hear from me are points that I thought of or good points I saw on Reddit and Twitter. Alright, let's get through this. The one biggest thing that I want to clear up, it is fucking sexual assault, okay? I'm not going to apologize, say that it isn't sexual assault, that I'm not a sexual assault victim. The touching that he is admitting, has admitted to many times, this touching that he admitted to not asking or getting my consent before he did, he felt up my tits on a couch with other people there. He stuck his hand up my shirt, under my bra, and felt up, fondled, whatever you want to say. He felt up my tits. Unwanted sexual touch is literally in the definition of sexual assault. It's fucking sexual assault, and I'm never going to apologize for saying it is, okay? Okay, so this is the big revelation, that the touching was actually a groping of the breast. The first thing people did was check if this was the case all along. Katie said originally that George was inching closer to unwanted places. When George speaks about this, he's alluding to it a bit more. I actually do think that the age difference between me and Katie was a pretty big factor. I am older than her, and based on what she said, I do have more experience than her. She never went into the exact specifics either. So out of respect for Katie, I've chosen not to give any more details than she did to make sure that I'm not airing out any information that she's not comfortable with being known. But I have clarified that the furthest things went was under the shirt touching. Whether it was properly implied or not, I think it was a huge disservice to herself that she left it so vague. But Nick, of course she's gonna leave it vague. You expect a victim to go into insane detail? Not insane detail, no but enough. Like this completely changes the context of the night for many people. She also did this with the cuddling. Why leave out the cuddling? The fact that George was doing this in front of others to me now sounds more damning. You can be as vague or as specific as you want, but then it's kinda on you if no one is understanding what was going on. This also brings up more questions. Like if your friend saw George grab your breast, why didn't she say a thing in the moment? Why did you continually get up and sit back down with him? Why didn't you show George any signs of discomfort? Like if I'm being super nice and understanding, and I shouldn't because she lied, it's very clear that she was fine in the moment, but was then thinking over it and reassessing what was really going on. And it's perfectly okay to regret a sexual experience when looking back at it from a clearer perspective. I just think it's crazy to push all of this onto George and get him canceled over it. Like he couldn't have known that you weren't cool with it. That was a complete miscommunication. There's a screenshot I said was from his friend that wasn't there for the assault, mentioned our ages and acknowledged, you know, the situation was weird. It's a real screenshot. What I got wrong and what was miscommunicated was who it was from. It was actually from instead of the guy who left or wasn't there for the assault, it was from the girl who wasn't there for the assault. Um, which I acknowledge is frustrating that I got that wrong and I didn't realize I got it wrong until after I posted it a long time, a, a long time after. And obviously when I don't come out and say, oh, I got that wrong, when he's the one to come out and say she got that wrong, it cr makes that into the biggest deal. I mean, yeah, obviously, like you're on Twitter watching this all go down. Stop being so passive and correct it. Of course, don't go full throttle debating no follower losers on Twitter. But if you see that, hey, people aren't understanding the full extent of the assault, clarify it. Hey, I got this wrong. I probably should correct it before it blows up. Like she's literally not taking responsibility for the fact that she messed up and then got called out for it. My bad. Uh, what I meant to say in that original stream where I said I was freshly 18, I said I was freshly 18 and just out of high school. What I meant to say was I was 18 and freshly out of high school. I just put it in front of the wrong thing. And I do acknowledge that. Uh, but once again, I feel like the idea is still the same, whether it's freshly 18 or freshly out of high school, because I had just graduated a few weeks earlier. It's not the same. One thing that Katie needs to realize is that it's not just fighting over facts like the message or whether it was fake or not. 
It's fighting over the narrative. Katie has a specific view of the night that paints George as an abuser. George has a different view that made him believe that everything was fine. Now that this has been aired out and his career is on the line, him and everyone who doesn't believe you are going to try to prove that his view of the night is more accurate than yours. So when you say freshly 18 to imply that George was predatory and it turns out that you aren't, it's going to be a big deal. I'm sorry, I do get frustrated with that because people are mad at me saying that I'm a liar because of these things instead of acknowledging the fact that he fucking admitted to doing what he did to me. Because what he admitted to, people think, isn't that bad. At the time, a titty grab wasn't on my mind, so when George admitted to it, I mean yeah, it happened. He also thought you were 21 at the time, remember? So yeah, him admitting it isn't like the golden ticket. Even looking back at it, George is admitting to the fact that he did it, not that it was assault. Obviously, he disagrees with that. I will acknowledge that there are inconsistencies, but when I have inconsistencies in my story and I address them and I acknowledge it, my whole story's out. It's in the trash and I'm seen as a liar for inconsistencies, but when he has an inconsistency or when, you know, even the 21 Brisbane thing saying I had a band that said I was, you know, when he has an inconsistency and I prove it wrong, have video footage of it, it's still used against me to this day. His inconsistencies are taken as the holy fucking grail and as the truth, even when proved wrong. And when I have an inconsistency, my whole fucking everything I've said uh, is gone. Katie hasn't owned up to any inconsistencies that I remember. Usually when she does, it's to the effect of, yeah, that was wrong, but it doesn't really matter because, which isn't owning up to anything because it did matter before people pointed it out. When it comes to the wristband, George never said that Katie was wearing it. And also since Katie's stream, I've gone back and reviewed texts from the time. And there was actually a picture where it was shown that they had this 21 plus wristband on one of their, one of their, one of their wrists. So from my perspective, it's a bunch of 21 plus year olds hanging out. I have no reason to think otherwise. Katie's inconsistencies goes against so many people's view of the night and what she left out, like the cuddling, plays into how George perceived the night. But anytime again he readmits to the fact that he touched me without consent, it's followed with a but. It's followed with a yes, I touched you. Yes, I didn't ask if it was okay. But you were smiling. But you seemed like you would have wanted it. But I assumed you wanted it because I'm fucking sick of it. I'm fucking sick of the butt. Okay, this actually happens a lot, and I don't understand how she doesn't understand this. You're accusing him of assault. He's obviously going to defend himself. The point he's trying to make is that yes, he did touch you, but because of all the evidence he provided, he thought that it was okay and he didn't mean any harm. It's actually crazy, and now that I see this new wave of online criticism Katie has gotten, I don't really feel that bad for her. Because everyone, including Katie, expects George to understand Katie's perspective and how she was hurt by this experience. But Katie absolutely refuses to see things through George's perspective. Um, I'm I'm just so sick of it. And and not even just that, it's then put into this video where the entire video is picking apart my story once again picking apart every single thing i said and once again focusing thing on things that are relevant to the fact that you fucking touched me i mean being like whoa she said my friend left early but really he left late what the fuck does that have to do with you touching me and not asking first george actually made it perfectly clear why because unlike katie who omits details like them cuddling George wants to tell the entire story and lay it out. I also chose to mention my online friend. It doesn't really add to the story, but she never mentioned him or the eighth person that she brought with. So I'm just saying it because that's how it happened. And I want to make sure the story is straight. Um, and again, he says, he says stuff like, he conveniently didn't acknowledge my age, despite the numerous, you know, opportunities he conveniently didn't acknowledge the power imbalance he conveniently doesn't remember these things i mean and then he says stuff like well i'm a good guy obviously he's gonna fucking say that you think that if he genuinely is the person to kind of be like this that he would go on his uh, on an edited fucking video and be like 
yeah, I'm a bad guy. Yeah, I purposefully... Oh, yeah, I knew her age. He's not gonna say that. He has a fucking career to protect. He's gonna say whatever the fuck he needs to. This is why George shouldn't have been so charitable. He was incredibly kind and respectful to Katie throughout his response, and Katie noticed none of it. It meant nothing to her. I didn't want someone I had watched for a while or with a large following to hate me for denying to even sit near him. Now, this makes me feel terrible. It's something that she mentions throughout this power imbalance, but this is not something at all that I was thinking about at the time. She was a VidCon invited guest. She had a hotel room on the same floor as Dream. She was friends with my friends. And honestly, I just never imagined that this is something that she could have thought. And I do think that's my problem. I should have been aware of this or at least the possibility of this being the case. And I am sorry. I, I feel terrible about it. I've never really thought about power imbalance at all, to be honest. In that room, I wasn't thinking about, you know, YouTube subscribers or fame or, or power or anything at all like that. I just saw us all as friends hanging out, having fun. Again, I'm not trying to downplay this by saying this. It is genuinely something that I'm going to be thinking about going into the future. Every source that he's getting, if you've noticed any time he says, well, she seemed comfortable, and I even asked, the person he's getting to confirm his point of view is his best friend. Or the guy that he called in the video, again, his friend. The three three guys that were there, the one guy I didn't mention, and the other two are all friends. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the only people that were there that night were him, you, Katie's four other friends, George's online friend, and Dream. Obviously, he's going to ask them for their perspective because they were there. Not only that, but we also have Ghosty's perspective of the night that also agrees with George. Like, who else is he supposed to ask? Someone not in that room? Why don't you ask your friends to back your story up, Katie? The other girl that was there during the assault that texted me the day after and said, are you okay? I was really uncomfortable with how touchy George was being. Those two girls, I met two days prior. Those two girls weren't my friends. They were lovely, lovely girls, yes. But I met them two days prior. And after VidCon, I never spoke to them again. My most recent texts from them are after I came out about my story. These aren't people, uh that you know these are people that i had just met um and the both of these girls were uncomfortable with the situa situation oh well never mind you called them your friends so i just assumed that also if they were uncomfortable why haven't they spoke up is one of these friends the one who got a fresh 18 year old drunk the three main things i said in my first stream and the three important things in this story age power and consent two things again he's conveniently not acknowledged or conveniently didn't acknowledge at the time. George apologizes for not giving verbal consent. Even after everything I've just said, things would be very different if I could just say that I had asked her if she was comfortable and she had said yes. But the fact is, I never did ask this. As I mentioned, there were a lot of things that she said she thought that I wasn't aware of that if I had known would have changed a lot. And going forward, this will be something that I take into account in every interaction I have with anyone sexual or not. Katie again refuses to even try and understand George's perspective. Therefore, there is no world where George thought that Katie was 21, even though that still is very possible. What power imbalance? It was a casual party and everyone there made content. George wasn't thinking about power imbalances and these power imbalances only matter if they're abused. All right, we'll stop it there. I think I made my points clear. I only discussed like half a Katie statement here, but I watched the whole thing. So if you want to go view the whole thing, it's linked in the description. If there's anything I want you to take away from this, it's that George should keep his career. I don't care if you believe Katie or not. I just don't think George should lose everything because of this messy situation. So that's it. How did the newest apology go over? Well, it was pretty good. In fact, it was great. Look at my tweet here. It's a W. But the skeptics didn't believe it was. In fact, they have all abandoned the George ship and began to mock him. Why is that? Considering everything, George has completely vindicated himself. 
On Twitter, you can see the tides have turned and people are slowly warming up to George's response. In that same token, people have expressed more negative thoughts about Katie's story and genuine questions have sprouted out because of the contradictions. People have been discussing what should happen and what will happen to Katie. Not only did she admit to drinking underage and getting these drinks from her friends, but she also made provable false statements in regards to that night trying to paint someone as an abuser. If anyone running a future event saw this and is smart, they wouldn't let Katie in because she is a huge liability, so she basically just blacklisted herself. Harsher critics of Katie would say that her entire online career should be taken away from her because of the false claims she tried to push onto George. Like, yeah, right. That girl's video. People see girl crying and it's yeah. like, oh. Like she should probably, baby. she should probably have her entire career destroyed, right? She probably shouldn't be allowed back in without like a huge, yeah. like redemptive. Okay. There needs to be like a, yeah. Because like, imagine if this would have gone any other way for the George dude, if it would have picked up traction, if he would have gotten like super canceled. Like, do you think these guys are going to come out and apologize or undo it? No, no, absolutely not. Some people who were so strong on George before came out to apologize, and people who certainly need to apologize haven't yet and all around dropped the topic. The craziest thing about this is um, when this all happened, some of the creators that are replying to the tweet right now were literally on my side about this exact same scenario. Do you not want to name Three them? years ago. No, not really. Okay. I will name one guy because he's a fucking asshole and he, he literally... Uh, has apologized to me twice in DMs now uh, for jumping to conclusions, and here he is doing it again. The Noah Pika clicks guy. He is. Oh, this fucking guy. He is. I've had a couple interactions with different. him. He is a that is, hard. That is the one guy that I will say right now, he jumps to conclusions at anything. And yes, I understand that Moonzy is your friend, right? But he has seen all the DMs. At least he said he's seen all the DMs from Moonzy's side. And when the actual allegations came out about me before, he was one of the people just retweeting it without any form of like serious proof. And even though his other friends were telling him that it wasn't real, he just kept tweeting about it and giving it attention. And then once I dropped my video, he was the first person to say, sorry, like it's just. And George is still friends with Dream and other content creators. So the content will keep flowing. So what's the problem? Let me play some clips from his response that I haven't shown. And I am truly sorry, Katie, for not realizing this and not taking this difference into account. It is clearly something that is extremely important to you. And I'm sorry. I am sorry, Katie. And I'm sorry for how this will affect you going forward. And I'm sorry that everything got to this point. He is apologizing to someone who is falsely accusing him of assault. This is all part of the Minecraft tax, a term popularized by well-known skeptic Nicholas Diorio. Essentially, these guys get paid an unbelievable amount of money to play a children's game, but they have to cater to a super sensitive audience. So if or when a situation like this comes up where there's a ton of parties and feelings involved and it's super complicated and abuse is not as clear cut, it is clear cut. You sexually assaulted someone by cuddling them for an hour and then placing your hand on their waist and up their shirt. Sorry buddy, doesn't matter if she nor anyone around you were giving any indication that they were feeling uncomfortable and actually were giving indication that everything was perfectly fine. And George is not the only one under the rule of the Minecraft tax. Everyone is. Puns, who remember had some allegations placed on him, made a statement supporting Katie. Punch and Dream made comments taking Shelby's side, even though it's pretty much he said, she said, and we can't go off of anything without DMs being shown. Fuck this guy. Fuck this guy. How does that taste? Poons? A little bit of your own medicine. Take the medicine. Take the medicine. Uh-oh. Ooh, what's this? You were fucking jumping on Wilbur Sir. Uh-oh. How does that medicine taste now, bitch? Saying you've been through, through therapy and a growing taken accountability. Downplaying your actions is discrediting the person you hurt. Shameful. I still think I've got the same perspective that this shouldn't be happening to him. But it just shows how fuck... Yeah, the most disgusting, wretched community. Exactly. It's like signing their own fucking death warrants and not even realizing they're doing it. Dude. And for what? To get a bit of clout off of the latest guy that's getting shit on. These people deserve everything they fucking get, man. 
Later, after Punch revealed that friend A was actually Dream, Dream responded to Punch basically saying, I'm sorry, even though Punch is like also going after Dream. And Dream is disagreeing with him, but he's still saying, I'm sorry, and playing it super safe. Even the viewers are somewhat under this influence, as if you go look at any statement criticizing Katie's contradictions, it either starts or ends with, hey, um, I don't mean to validate your feelings, but... And I get the whole respect thing. I try to be respectful when I cover topics. If I said something really stupid, you can yell at me in the comments. But there comes a time where you have to grow a backbone and put your self-respect over the respect of others. And George, for some reason, doesn't want to do that. You're being accused of the worst thing ever. It's okay for you to show Katie's DMs in order to prove yourself right. She even gave you permission. He reached out to Ghosty about it, asking what this was even about, and did the same to others, including Katie. Now, I'm not going to be showing Katie's text with Dream because at the time, Dream had told her that her messages and conversation would not leave their texts. You're being accused of sexual assault. Stop apologizing for things you don't have to apologize for. You got, you are overreacting. He debunked all the allegations, even if he was being a cuck. No, you guys, like, you, you, yeah. you, I, I, guys, yeah. like, it's not one side of things. Both things can be true. Katie, manipulative liar and like a genuinely vindictive trying to like destroy this guy she's not only just like dumb she's actually vindictive and using attack words and lying about this guy faking text messages to try to destroy himself uh, to try to destroy his career and just to, like destroy his whole fucking life basically but at the same time george has made ridiculous concessions acting as if like genuinely he has to apologize for the age thing or the empower uh the power imbalance thing which further feeds this monster of an audience that will now go on to think that this is okay behavior and call out future people for the same bullshit down the line he is enabling this monster he's feeding the monster that that has come and uh ate half of him and he's only has like half of his fucking life left basically like he is part of the problem. You have lost a considerable amount due to these allegations. Mr. Beast has dropped George from Feastables. There's a part of your fan base that will never come back to your side or believe that you are not an abuser. Stop trying to appease the people who will never come back. Okay, well then, the, I mean like, well, I don't feel bad for the guys then because they all like create this culture as well by feeding into it and apologizing. So it's also their fault. So fuck them all, I guess. Like you're literally creating the monster that's eating you later. So, you yeah. know. But it's it also their fault too. They like, shouldn't be like they apologize. So they, they they're empowering these groups to do these same things over and over again in the future. Yes, so. it's gonna happen again and again. Yeah, of course. These communities yeah. are fucking retarded. But they have what, to at some point. The point of bowing down. Well, the point is you get to keep a larger audience. But I mean, what they need to do is just say like, hey, listen, some people might disagree with this, or whatever. But like, this is some retarded shit. And then you just you lose some fans, you cultivate a better fan base, and you move on. But when you try to aim yourself to be family friendly, what you're you're aiming for maximum audience penetration. You want the biggest audience that you can possibly get. And in doing so, you're going to end up making some absolutely absurd compromises, and this is one of them. So as long as they're trying to be essentially sellouts and, and work a crowd as hard as they can and get as many fans as they can, then yeah, this is the result. As Destiny Best said, George has the diamond sword that could slay the Ender Dragon. All he has to do is take a harder stance and sure, alienate a part of his audience, but begin forging a community that better reflects him rather than his audience create the perfect content creator a mold he'll never fit in. Aw oh, sweet, a new personal best.